our dear pastor, he's senior pastor of, at Kingdom Life Covenant Church in Hershey, Pennsylvania. And truly a man of God that is anointed. Our hearts have connected. And this is a divine appointment because he did not have any time on his schedule for the rest of the year except this weekend. And not only that, now I want you guys to bless this man as he's preaching. He has left his wife at home who has been bedridden for two years to do kingdom work. Because God has called him to come to Vancouver to bring a message to our hearts. So I pray in the name of Jesus that your ears are open to hear what the Spirit has to say unto thee. That your heart is open, that the grounds are prepared by his glory. That as the man of God cometh, hallelujah, come to us, man of God. Speak unto us, prophet, your servant. Hear it, O God, and receive him in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen, Ali. Hallelujah. Mighty, mighty God. Mighty God. Hallelujah. It's a strange thing. I traveled 3,000 miles just to land and come home. I feel like I'm home in this atmosphere. There's a great expression of liberty and freedom. How many know the Bible says, where the Spirit of the Lord is? Come on. There is liberation. The very nature of the Holy Spirit is to liberate. I thank God that there is a freedom in this place to praise and to worship. Any old charismatic could put their hand together, but I know people are serious when they start dancing. Come on. Do a study of the dance and you'll find that the dance is always in the context of a victory. You could clap your hands at a ball game. Come on. You can watch a little ball go over a fence. You can go to Toronto and watch the Blue Jays. and You can see all of that and people will clap their hands. But in the Bible they started to dance when they saw the enemies wash up on the shore after they passed through the Red Sea. Come on. I mean, the Bible says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. So I do believe in clapping, but then sometimes you've got to go from clapping to shouting. How many know the walls of Jericho didn't come down at the clap, it came down at the shout? Come on, it came down at the shout. And there are some things that are shut up in your life that God wants you to have, and you got to shout it down. So I, I just want to, I don't have enough appendages to praise Him. Really. Because I want my entire being to be an instrument of praise. He is so worthy to be praised and to be glorified. Can you say amen? amen? It truly is a joy to be here and to be in this area of the world and to be with you this morning. As Pastor Ali said, and it's a joy meeting his beautiful wife, uh, we had quite a time in the last two days. We spent many, many hours together in the presence of God. Much preaching, prophesying, worship, prayer, it seems like a lot was accomplished in just two and a half days. And I thank God for all of that. And when I get home tomorrow night at 10.30, Monday night, I leave early Wednesday morning. And I'll be in New York ministering Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, 
Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, Sunday morning. And so I've got a calendar in front of me. I've got a calendar behind me. But none of it is significant as to what I'm doing right now. Come on. Because now is really the only time we have. Can you say amen? That's why the Bible says now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. Regardless of the plans God has for your life, we all get to live our life one day at a time. You say, Pastor Phil, how do I come into my future? Be faithful today. And when tomorrow is today, be faithful again. And repeat being faithful every day. And eventually, someone say eventually. Eventually, eventually your future will be today. Can you say amen? amen? So much is in my heart, but God has put something in my heart to encourage you. And I want you to turn with me in your Bible this morning to 2 Samuel chapter 5. And I was being stirred. This was not the original direction I was going to go in, but as we were worshiping God, and this is not unusual, the Lord began to stir something else in my spirit. And when God has sent me to the body at large, He got hold of my life when I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school in New York. I thought I was going to pursue an education, higher education, and pursue a path in the medical field, but God had other plans. I never went to college, never became a doctor, but the Lord called me. In fact, the call of God didn't come when I was 17. I was separated from my mother's womb. But that's when I heard the call. When he got hold of my life. And that was 51, 2, 3. That was 36 years ago. And from that time until this, the Lord has been so good to me. He's brought me places I never ever dreamed I'd ever go. He's caused me to stand before people I'd never thought I'd ever get a chance to minister to, pray for. Presidents, mayors, never been to college. Just a man that has yielded to God's call. But the most important call in my life is not who I preach to, it's who I serve. It's who I serve. I live for the audience of one, not for the audience of many. Because I read in my Bible that if you seek to please man, you cannot please God. But I learned that when you seek to please God, you become a blessing to many men. Amen. Did you hear what I said? Amen. Everyone within the sound of my voice is a significant individual in this world. God did not, try to, God did not make you and then try to figure out what he could do with you. Before you were ever a thought in mama and daddy's heart, before you were ever a dream, when two people came together and said, I do at an altar, and they dreamed of having a family. Before that ever occurred, God told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. Amen. And before you came forth, I ordained you. And I called you to be a prophet to the nations. I'm here to tell you, that God's plan for your life preceded your existence. Amen. And the fact that you are here and there is no one exactly like you. The fact that you are here is a testimony that God has got a plan. Amen. And God wants you to fulfill that plan. And so today, God has sent me simply to encourage you. And to be his voice, I wish... In a way, I could just sit down, pull my chair right here, and I would preach this message right to you, eyeball to eyeball. And I'd want to speak into your life. That's how desperate 
and desirous I am to see every one of you encouraged and every one of you hear the word of the Lord. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 10. We're going to look at one verse of scripture, something the Lord has really made real to me. And David went on. Say that with me. And David went on. I'm reading out of the King James. It says, And David went on and grew great. Thank you. And grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. I've been preaching the word of God since the night I got saved. The day after I started preaching before I even knew what was in there. I mean, one verse just burned in my heart that night, and I went to school preaching the Word of God. And that verse, that, that verse was, The thief cometh not but for to rob, kill, and destroy. And I've come that you might have life, and life more abundantly. God exploded that verse in my young heart, and I started preaching. I only knew one verse, and I, that's all you need, really need to know in order to say something worthwhile because all God's word is filled with power. Can you say amen? amen? But from that day until this, I've accumulated a few more verses. And in my time of preaching and in my time of studying the word of God, I can't begin to tell you. I want you to hand me that Bible, brother, if you would. My church bought me a an iPad. This was the pad I used to use. I've gotten this Bible rebound three times. It's not my original Bible, but I've had it 20 years. There's not a page that's not marked on it. I have eaten the Word of God. Next to Jesus, it is my great love, the Scriptures. Like David, I have learned that in my affliction, thy word hath quickened me. The book of Ephesians has needed special attention. I was in a convention. Look at these pages. I was in a convention. Well, I received my Bible not long ago back from the book binder the third time. And they put a little sticky note. You know what it said? Not again. In other words, go buy yourself another Bible. But there's something about your Bible. I know where everything is. I write little notes. Right? I can see what page, what, where it is. And so I was in a conference and a pastor said, Brother Phil, can I borrow your Bible? He was in the front preaching and he was just sharing it. He left his Bible up in the pulpit. He said, Brother Phil, can I borrow your Bible? I thought, ooh, this before it was going to go to get bound again. I said, Lord, don't let him turn to the book of Ephesians. No sooner I prayed that prayer, he says, turn to Ephesians chapter 3. <laughs> he turns to Ephesians, you know, and he looks at the page. He said, Brother Phil, I didn't know you had an original copy of the Dead Sea Scrolls. You read it Absolutely. Because I read when God told Jeremiah, Son of man, eat the word. Amen. Don't just read it, eat it. Turn to your neighbor and say, don't just read it, eat it. In other words, let it get inside of you. Come on, let it become part of you. You are what you eat. Can you say amen? I want to talk to you about a great key to victory because I'm utterly convinced that Christianity and victory are meant to be synonymous terms. When you understand what Christ did for you, who you are in Christ, who Christ is in you, that will end every day of despair. When you recognize, I'm still discovering what transacted in my life 35 years ago. I'm still learning the depths of salvation. Still understanding the implications of the mighty baptism of the Holy Ghost. The implication that 
God lives in me. Amen. That behind this tie lives the spirit of impossibility. Still trying to understand that what is inside of me is more than equal to everything and anything I might ever face in life. I believe when John said, greater is he that is in thee than he that is in the world. Come on now. There are some Christians, all they think about is how bad the devil is. I want you to know this morning, he's under my feet. Because I read in the Bible that Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death. Hebrews chapter 2. I read in Colossians chapter 1 that he spoiled the principalities and powers. And he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in the cross. Can you say amen? And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, Now thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. Amen. I looked up the word always in the Greek. You know what it means? Yes. Always. Amen. The word always means without exception. Yes. In every circumstance. And he maketh manifest by us the savor, the aroma of his knowledge in every place. Amen. That means every Christian should smell like victory. Yes. We should exude an aroma. When I was a little boy, I'll never forget, I would go into the bathroom. My dad would have been there and shaved. And he used to like this uh, cologne. It's an old cologne called Canoe. And when I knew dad was in the bathroom, I didn't see him go in. I didn't see him come out. But when I went in the bathroom, I could smell the cologne. And I, I, you say, that's canoe. I say, no, that's my dad. Because I associated that aroma with a person. And I knew where he was, because everywhere he left, went, he left an aroma of his person there. Come on now. Jesus ascended up to heaven but he left an aroma of victory in the earth. Can you say amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah to Jesus. And David went on and grew great. And the Lord God of hosts was with him. One of the things we must never forget is that there are mindsets we need to possess if we will prosper in the will of God. You see, you could be saved, but miserably saved. That's right. That's right. You know what I'm saying? Yes. I'm not diminishing our salvation. I'm simply telling you, victory is not determined by what transacted in your heart. It will be determined by what's going on in your mind. In a moment, I went from death into life. In a moment, I went from unrighteousness into complete righteousness. In a moment, I went from darkness in light. But it's a process to renew the thinking. That's right. That's right. That's right. That is an ongoing process where the Bible says we are transformed by the what? Renewing. You know what renewing means? The complete reconstruction of the mind. So you can be saved and think wrong. Many Christians are saved. They're saved. They have eternal life. But they're miserable until that day. Come on. And God has got something greater for us. And that's what I've come to tell you. Now what's interesting is David went on and grew great. I find the very same verse in Genesis chapter 26, 13 about Isaac. When Isaac was in Gerar. It says, and the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. Yes. Same thing. David went on, grew great. In other words, he went forward. The Lord God of hosts was with him. Let me just give you this one other thought before we continue. I need to lay a foundation. Paul said, whatsoever things are, what? Philippians 4. Whatsoever things are true. 
whatsoever things are pure. Come on. Whatsoever things are honest. Whatsoever things are of a good report. Whatsoever things will produce virtue and praise. What does he go on to say? Think on these things and the God of peace shall be with you. It goes on. In other words, Paul gives us a grid. I call it a grid. I was raised in New York City, the Bronx, New York. And it was a pretty rough place where I was raised. Mom and Dad couldn't wait to leave the city, and we moved out in 1972 to the eastern end of Long Island, if, by the Hamptons, a beautiful place, out by the ocean. And we were all excited as a family. I was excited as a young boy. They took me to the school I was going to be attending, and it was like, wow. It looked like a college campus. There were baseball fields and football fields. I mean, I grew up in the city, and I, you know, hardly knew what grass was. I mean, we see it, but I don't know. Everything was cement and asphalt. So this was going to be a new life. And, one of, and it was a new home, and they had a new home built. And we'd be excited. We'd drive out, and we'd see the home, you know, develop. And Dad couldn't wait to have a lawn. And he took time off from his work, and he said, son, he'd say, we're going to plant a lawn. And we're going to have the best lawn. And Dad researched, you know, all the things you've got to do. And so we went to the hardware store, and we got pitchforks and shovels and everything you need that we didn't need in the Bronx. <laughs> you know, and so I'll never forget, it was hot August. And we went out there, and we put the pitchfork in because we had to turn the soil. That's when I learned that in new construction, whatever doesn't make it in the house, the contract is buried in the front lawn. I mean, two by fours were there, nails, shingles. Well, if we would have just went with grass seed and don't do all that, how many know it would have been a pretty patchy lawn? Wouldn't have looked very nice. So we had to prepare the soil. So what dad did was, he took a few studs, and then he took metal, uh, like chicken wire, that had a very little grid, and he made a screen. He put it over the wheelbarrow, and we would shovel the dirt that had all kinds of stuff in it, and throw it on the screen. Whatever made through the screen, we kept as soil. Whatever didn't make it was garbage and had to be thrown out. That took a long time to do. But if I could show you a picture of what that lawn looked like, it was even, it was beautiful. But Dad made a screen. That's what Paul gave us. It's a screen for our thinking. If it doesn't fit through the whole of truth, throw it away. If it is not honest according to God's word, get rid of it. No matter how much you feel about it, it's got to go through the grid of truth. And if it doesn't agree with the word, it's garbage, throw it out. Can you say amen? And if you will learn to funnel and factor all of your thinking to the Word of God. You will have a soil in your life where the seed of the Word will grow inside of you. And you will become fruitful. Can you say amen? amen. Now, the verse we read this morning to me, the Lord spoke this to me. He said it is the most significant verse in the life of David. David is one of the most colorful characters in the Bible. Aren't you glad the Bible is not just a book of Proverbs? But it is a book that involves real lives. It's not mythological tales. Abraham was a real man. Moses was a real man. David was a real man. And, and God in his story, it all speaks of Christ. He comes in the volume of the book. He said, it is written of me. And on the road to Emmaus, 
he started to open up the scriptures beginning at Moses and in all the law and the Psalms and the prophets he showed them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself he said here I, I would have loved to have been in that Bible study he said here I am in Genesis and here I am in Exodus. And here I am, come on now, in Numbers. Here Leviticus. Here I am in Numbers. Here I am in Deuteronomy. Here I am in Joshua. Here I am in Judges. And oh my God, this whole book is about Him! But God presents to us truth for our lives in how He has dealt with people as they walked across the stage of history in their time. And David is one of the most popular in the scriptures. He is the son of Jesse. He is... Jesus is associated with being the son of David. He's the fulfillment of the promise made by God to David that none of your seed shall fail sitting upon the throne. In other words, your seed will inherit the throne. It wasn't Solomon, it was Christ. You can't even begin to understand the life of Jesus. You can't begin. Open up the New Testament, Matthew 1 verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The son of David, the son of Abraham. You can't even begin to understand Jesus. You've got to know about David. The fact that he's the seed of David and the seed of Abraham means he's the one that inherits the throne. He rules and he inherits the land. The earth is his. When you put, together, put them together, that means he rules over all the world. Can you say amen? This is the God that we worship. This is the Christ that we praise. This is why we dance. Because there's a king that rules in righteousness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. David is one of the most universally relatable characters in all the Bible. David is as ordinary as they come. He was an ordinary man with some extraordinary promises, just like you. Like each of us in Christ, the Bible says in 1 Peter 1 and 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. It's not just about getting saved and going to heaven. It's about getting saved and becoming like Christ. Come on, can you say amen? amen? The glory of Christianity, I touched on this the other night. The glory of Christianity is the fact that talk, God takes common men and common women and He does extraordinary and common things with their lives and through their lives. Like our brother Paul sitting back there. A man that was nothing but a prisoner. Right, brother Paul? You told me that. But when I look at him now, he's not a con. He's not a criminal. He's a son of God. And, and there's no telling, Paul, what God can do through your life. One day we were hosting. One day we were host. Is this okay, Pastor? I feel so at home. I want to tell you everything I know. It's not all that much, but I'll tell you whatever I know. Hallelujah to Jesus. My God. My God. I'm just one of those. That, you know, we have, I don't think you have this problem here, but in America we've got a problem. We've got people that look at their watches. I've never seen anybody in a movie look at their watch. I've never seen anybody at a football game look at their watch. Well, maybe the wives of the men who are watching. I was watching the Super Bowl. I said, honey, no, don't change the channel. It's only three more minutes. She goes, that's football minutes. I've never seen three minutes take so long. I didn't tell her they still had three timeouts left. <laughs> oh, 
My, 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 my. There's no telling what God can do. None whatsoever. David is an extraordinary, extraordinary man. A common man with an extraordinary, that God does extraordinary things to. David gave us the Psalms. How many love the book of Psalms? It's the most relatable book in all the Bible. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. When you got a reason to celebrate, how many know you could turn to Psalms? Come on. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Come on, shout unto God with the voice of triumph. And we, we begin to praise God. But how many know when you're going through a hard time, you could turn to the same book? If you're in the heights, you could turn to Psalm. And when you're in the depths, you could turn to Psalm. Because the Psalms are the songs of David primarily when he was going through every phase of life. The same book that says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. The same book! You could also read, How long, O God, shall the enemies surround me? Same book! And I want you to know, that you are also going to face the same things in life. There are things that will happen to you that will cause you to shout, and there are things you will face that will say, Jesus, I need you now. Your victory will never be determined by your circumstance. It must be determined by the reality of what's living on the inside of you. David was a man one day that had a prophecy. From Samuel, we're not talking about some new little prophet. We're talking the prophet, the prophet. And he had this word of the Lord that one day he would be a king. Wow, what a prophecy. Little did he know, and the prophet didn't tell him it would be 15 years. Isn't it amazing God just leaves certain details out? He tells you where he's going to take you, but he doesn't tell you how he's going to get you there. And I learned with God to go up, you go down. I learned with God to take a right, he'll take your left. Well, you're trying to figure out where am I, God says, I know exactly where you are. Oh yeah, come on now. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God will say, I'm calling you out of Egypt and lead you right in front of a Red Sea. And there you stand and say, did we really hear God? And God says, why are you crying out? Stretch your rod. Continue to believe me. And you'll look at what you're facing. And suddenly the miraculous begins to occur. Because God will make a way where there seems to be no way. God speaks. The prophetic language is a language of destinations. But there's always a journey from where you are to where God wants to take you. And the journey is always an issue of trust. Where you're going is an issue of faith. Faith comes by? Okay. And hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So in other words, faith, in order to really have faith, faith requires a revelation of God's plan. Because faith comes by? If I haven't heard God say anything, I could call it faith, but it's really not faith. Okay. Okay. So God says, I've called you to be an apostle, son. Faith comes alive. Yes, Jesus. I just want to be your servant, but let your will be done. And God will give you faith concerning what he wants. He's given you words about this church. God will give you faith. But he'll never tell you the price you have to pay. Faith is required for the destination. Yes. Trust is required for the path. Yes. Faith, listen to me, faith, faith is centered in a revelation of what he said he'll do. Yes. 
Trust is centered in a revelation of who he is. It's not good enough to know what God will do. You must grow in the grace and in the knowledge of who he is. Because I guarantee you that your path is going to become very confusing. And when you cannot see the destination from where you are, and it seems like you are lost somewhere, you better be able to say, I know in whom I have believed. You better be able to say, I may not know how I'm going to get from here to there, but I know He is faithful. Come on. Does that make sense? You see, many times life will bring delays we never even once entertained that we'd have to face. Hurdles we never considered we'd have to cross. Mountains that seem so insurmountable we'd never even thought we would ever face them. But here is a great key. We must live with a ready attitude. What did it say? And David went on. Say that with me. And David went on. We've got to live with an attitude to go on. Regardless of what we face, I am going on. Otherwise, those challenges, those delays, those hurdles, those mountains will cause you to give up, especially on the inside. Let's consider some of David's challenges, and I'm going to move this right along. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 6. It says these words, And it came to pass when they were come, that he looked on Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Now this is speaking about Samuel the prophet. He was sent to Jesse's house to anoint the king. The word of the Lord came to the prophet and said, How long will you mourn over Saul? Sometimes, like Samuel, we spend too much time crying over things that didn't work out. Things that we had hoped, we had believed, but they didn't work out. God says, How long are you going to mourn over what didn't work? Fill your horn with oil. I'm about to anoint something else. Okay. Get to Jesse's house. Can you imagine? Now back in the old days, when the prophet came to your house, it wasn't always and necessarily a happy occasion. Man, you say, oh my God. Because see, back then, you know, he's the oracle of God. When you needed a word from the Lord, they didn't have the Holy Spirit living in them. And prophecy should really be more confirmational. You know, if you ever receive a prophecy from a prophet and it's a shock to you, I'm going to give you advice. Wait on that prophecy. Amen. As pastor said, you need to heed the wisdom of your pastor. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But in the Old Testament, when kings want to know what to do, they say, where's their prophet? I need a prophet. So when a prophet was coming to the house, it was, oh my God, is something wrong? Is something, Samuel, comest thou peaceably? Yes. Yeah, well, we see you have a little horn of oil. Yeah, God sent me, Jesse. You may not even know this, but there's a king in your household. What? You mean one of my boys? You got to be kidding. No, no, where are they? Hey, Iliab, Shama, come on in from the field. Hey, Dad's calling. And before you know, what? I think there would have been a real buzz going around the house. Hey, did you hear the prophet? Was that, was that Samuel's horse out there? That what? My God, the prophet's here. What's going on? I heard that one of the guys is, one of the boys is a king. I bet you it's Shama. The other servant said, no, I think it's alive. He looks like that guy's so big. And I always knew he looks like he's going to, he's a leader. And they're like, wow, there's going to be a special dinner. Everybody's coming in because the prophet is here. And, and David is out in the field and he sees all of this going on. And he's with the little flock. Come on, I mean, this is what I see when I read the Bible. And David says, hey, Shama, Shama. What is it, David? Shama, what's going on? I, I see Dad all excited and Lab's running. What's going on? You haven't heard? No, I'm just here with the little flock. 
and I'm taking care of dad's sheep here. What's going on? The prophet has come. The pro you mean Samuel? Samuel's come. Why has he come to our house? Well, he said that one of us is a king. Are you kidding me? No, so we're having a special dinner, and he wants to meet all the sons, and wow, I'm just so excited. Okay, I'm coming. No, wait, 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 where are you going, David? Well, you just said that, you just said that one of us are king, and he wants to meet, you know, no, but David, not you. You don't need to come. You're just a little boy. We'll let you know how everything went. Just stay with the flock. How do you think David felt? His heart began to sink. So here comes the seven brothers. And here's the prophet with the oil. Eliab, no, no. Ooh, look at this man. He looks up. He's head and shoulders above his brethren. Saul was head and shoulders above his brethren. We've got tendencies to anoint what the new thing if it resembles the old thing. Oh, come on. So he goes to anoint them and the Spirit of God speaks to him and said, No. Seeing I have rejected him. For man looketh upon the outward. And I looketh upon the heart. Oh yeah. I'll never forget, we had this conference at our church. There was about 35, 40 pastors. And there was a man on Long Island, four hours away from where I live in Pennsylvania. His son was hooked on heroin. 18-year-old son. He had just shot heroin into his veins that night. Came home in a drug-induced stupor. And the father grabbed his son put him in the back seat of the car. He said, we are going to Hershey. That's where our church is. Son, I mean, he's just visiting the stars. He's out of it. They drive four hours until three, four in the morning. Get a hotel room. We're having the meeting that morning. And the son, you know, just totally out of it, basically. The father says, get up, we're going to church. So he goes, oh, dad, I don't want any. He said, we're going, you don't have a choice. His father was desperate. Brings the young man to church, to service, and I'm making some closing remarks, and one of my dear friends, a pastor, who was one of the biggest drug dealers in the United States at one time. He used to run drugs from Washington, D.C., all the way up to Boston. And uh, now he pastors a tremendous, pastor of a tremendous church in, in uh, Pittsburgh. So... Uh, Anyway, he's in the back. He said, Pastor Phil! Pastor Phil! Everybody looks, turns around. He said, we have an emergency here. Because he saw this young man, and he had gone to the bathroom, and he talked to the father. I said, well, come on, Pastor Terry. What is it? And I see they bring this young man in the service. I said, let's get a chair and put it right here. Broke the service. Broke it up. But let's put a chair right here. and Sit down, young man. With that, about five preachers get around him all dressed with suits, you know. They get around this young man. The father gives us a brief explanation. We're going to pray and believe God for this bondage to be broken. Amen. Before we prayed, every one of those preachers testified to this young man how every one of them had served jail time. To my surprise, I didn't know I was hanging around with all ex-cons. <laughs> so my God, I didn't know these all my friends. I've never seen the inside of my mother ever knew. No. These are powerful men of God who served five years, who served seven years, who did this, who did that, until the last man, Pastor Terry, one of the most notorious drug dealers for years, he said, son, let me just capsulize it. We are all ex-somethings with suits on. Man looks at the outward, God sees the heart. Uh, yeah. 
And so we got a dilemma. Jesse, we got a problem. I see seven sons. God said, there's a king. Do you have another one somewhere? Well, I got a little kid out in the field. Surely I didn't think he should be in the lineup. Go get David! So David is out there and here he comes. You know what I call this? The rejection test. Have you ever felt like you were overlooked? Have you ever felt like, you know, everybody else is blessed and you're a mess? God's moving to the left and the right and you're saying, Lord, what about me? David was in this place where he felt left out, he felt rejected as a pastor. How many times have I counseled people that have wasted years because of a rejection that took place 30 years earlier. I remember one dear sister, she was rejected from her father. It was a horrible circumstance. And now I'm looking into the face of a 50-year-old woman. I could see the lines of life on her face. I've heard about decades of disappointment. And I said, my dear sister... The problem is you made rejection an event. Uh, you made it a memorial. You made it an event in your life when it was only an opinion. It doesn't matter whether man rejects me. I read in the word, I have chosen you. Come on, how many are chosen of God? David could have stopped right there and said, David, come on, David. No, I'm not coming. He could have sat there in the woods with an offense, come on, as big as Texas in his heart. And he would have eliminated himself from the possibility of seeing something glorious unfold in his life if he would have nursed that rejection. But the Bible says, and David went David went on. David went on and he grew great. Let me tell you what greatness is. Greatness does not mean you have a big house and a lot of money. Do you know when, what it means to be great? It means the full potential of what's present. In other words, when I look at the beautiful rose and its crowned blossom, how many know that is in the seed? Right? It's hard to believe that. But through the process of time, that seed sprouts through the earth. It becomes a stem. Then it becomes a crown. Then it becomes a blossom. And I could say, what a great rose. Now when you're going to buy your wife roses, are you going to give her a dozen seed and say, honey, I've been thinking about you today. And I just wanted to give you these rose seeds because you're just so special to me. Brother, she's going to take those seeds. Right? Now, everything is in that seed. But if you bring her long stem roses, woo, you're going to have a good night. Because the blossom of the rose is the testimony of a great seed. A seed that became great. And inside of every one of you and in, every, and in me is the full potential of the blossom of God's will. There's an apostle living inside of you. You may not now be an apostle, but as you grow, Something will emerge out of you. Give it time. Give it challenges. Give it years. Give it seasoning. And one day the blossom of that office will come forth. See, God's will, everything, greatness is on the inside of us. The problem though is we stop on our journey and we don't go on. Is this making sense to you? 
I know I'm encouraging myself with this message. I'll tell you. I'm going to buy the tape. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Greatness is a result of growth and development, and growth is a process. Never quit. Turn to your neighbor say, just go on. Listen to what Jesus said. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Paul, when you were in prison, when no one would have choose, chosen you. God did, I know you know that. God did not choose us when we were at our best. While we were yet in sin, Christ died for us. You think he died for a clean church? He died to make the church clean. He died when we were filthy. He died when we were ugly. Come on. He died when the only time we'd mention his name is when we were frustrated and upset. Oh, yes. And let me give you a piece of marriage advice while I'm at it. Something the Lord made real to me. Married 34. This year will be 33 years. It says, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, what was the condition of the church when he gave himself for it? Was it wonderful or ugly? Ugly. Husbands, love your wives when she's ugly. Come on. When she's at her worst, you have the opportunity to demonstrate the love of Christ toward her. And I guarantee you when that kind of love is extended toward her when she's not having her best day and she's not looking the best and it's a very bad hair day. Come on! And she's feeling her world is crumbling. Don't you look for somebody else that looks a little better. Just begin to love her the way Christ loved you. And I guarantee you. Woo! And I guarantee you, when a revelation of that love begins to invade her world, something will take place in her life like when the revelation of his love invaded your world. All right. Let us go on. Amen? 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. 1 Samuel 17, verse 28. Someone saying, David went on. And he grew great. And Eliab, his elder brother, heard what he spake unto the men. Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, why did you come down hither? And who have you left your few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart. For you are come down that you might see the battle. The first thing I want to say that is so commendable about David's character. This is his same brother that got rejected. And he's saying, David, notice what he said. Who, he said, who did you leave your little sheep with? David was able to leave sheep, receive a prophecy, you're called to be a king, and go back and still keep sheep. Some people get a prophecy and they're ready to leave the church. They used to be an usher, but somebody said, I called you to be a pastor, and now you can't see them anywhere. Now they can't pick up the little paper. I still pick up paper on the floor because I was an usher. Once a servant, always a servant. Can you say amen? David got anointed by Samuel, said, you are the next king. He said, oh God, that's wonderful. He went right back to take care of the sheep. But now this is the occasion when Goliath is challenging the whole army. And for 40 days, a whole army is terrorized because the champion of the Philistine is before them. And David has no idea this is going on. And Jesse says to David, Son, your, 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 your brothers are in the army. Here's some cheese. Here's some bread. Go and bring some refreshments and bring me word again how the battle's going. Sure, Dad. 
So he says to a keeper, take care of the flock. And David, now listen, steps into the first step of destiny by being submitted and obedient to what his father said to do. He doesn't know what he's about to step into. Someone say, obey your authority. Don't come out from under authority. Because you'll make your trip a whole lot lo longer and harder to where God wants to bring you. Yes, Dad, I'm submitted to you. And he runs through the field and he runs through the woods. And I'm sure David knew how to cut through those woods. He shouted for the battle. And when he gets there, he said, well, there's something strange. And he could see the look on his brother's face. And he's got cheese, he's got bread. He's saying, hey, guys, he's got some things here. And, you know, and he's talking to them and suddenly Goliath comes out. And when Goliath came out, something came out of David that nobody knew was in there. Sometimes the challenges we face are ordained of God to reveal what's on the inside of us. If it wasn't for Goliath, everybody would have said he's only a shepherd. But because of Goliath, they said, my God, he's a warrior. The reason why Goliath was permitted to get on the stage was to reveal David. Come on. Say, God, why am I facing what I'm facing? To reveal who it is that lives on the inside of you. Eliab, Eliab says to him, oh, I know why you're here. You pride, David. And this is the next test, the misunderstood motive test. Yeah, we know why you're here. And David said, what have I done now? Is there not a cause? I love what David said, and I want you to hear me, church. Hear me, Gospel Tabernacle. If you hear nothing else, hear this. David basically was saying is, I'm not going to let you make me the issue. Because there's a greater national cause that we need to understand here. You and I have got to be willing to pay any price for the cause. I said there's a cause. It's not about you. It's not about me. There's a city in Vancouver here. There are people that need to get saved. There are families that need to be restored. Come on. There are Persians that need to come out from under the dominating religion of Islam and step into the grace of God and come to know the saving power of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Somebody say, there's a cause. We need to live always, always with our eyes on the greater cause. This is what caused me to always continue on in ministry. How many times did things that not turn out the way I anticipated? How many times people in my congregation, I thought truly they're going to be faithful and they will betray you. They'll stab you in the back. Come on now. How many times, and here you're just trying to pour your heart out. I could have quit 10, 20 times over, but I didn't focus on this one and that one. I knew there was a cause. There's a cause. What can cause a Paul to endure 185 stripes across his back? His back looks like a plowed field. What can cause a Paul to be in perils on land and by sea? What can cause a Paul that when he's bitten by a viper, shake it off? What can cause a Paul that after he gets stoned for preaching in Lystra, he comes back to consciousness and says, I'm going back in the same city to preach? What can... What can cause a Paul that after they whip him and Silas and thrust him in the inner prison, the inner, inner solitary confinement when there is no visitors, where he lives with rats and rodents and he's serving God, what can cause that man to not become bitter and say, Jesus, is this what I get for serving you? But instead, what causes an apostle to say to Silas, come on. Let's pray and let's praise the Lord and let's worship Him. What causes Him? I'll tell you what it is. He says, I've not been disobedient 
to the heavenly vision. Paul says, I'm obsessed. There is a heavenly vision that got hold of me. And I live with it before my eyes every moment of every day. You could whip me. You could stone me. You could stab me. The only way you could stop me is you're going to have to cut my head off. Because as long you could throw me in prison, and guess what? I'll write a letter. It's all going to keep coming out of me. I'll never quit because there's a greater cause than what's going on in my life. Wow. And I want to say this as a corporate body. You're a beautiful people. You really are. You've got such a beautiful spirit. You are only a seed of what God's going to do at Gospel Tabernacle. You're only a beginning portion. I prophesy to you, Pastor, there's such life in this place. This place is going to be filled with people. I'm telling you, don't you even think about quitting. You stay the course because God's laid His hand on you and there's evidence. There's a health. There is fruit. There's a beautiful presence of God in this place. But I want to speak to you as a body now. Together, there's a greater cause for your fellowship. You'll have opportunity to get offended while you're here. They don't come better than Pastor Ali, but he's not perfect. The person next to you loves you, but they may step on your toe once in a while. You'll have reason you may think, oh, I'm overlooked. Oh, I could have been used here. Listen, but you're part of a body. If God's joined you, whatever God joined together, let no man put asunder, not even you. But together you've got a cause. Together you're a seed and there's some beautiful roses of redemption that God wants to bring out of the bouquet of this fellowship. Something that will be a thing of beauty to the world He's called you to reach for Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Don't you ever contemplate trying to go somewhere unless God sends you and there's a confirmation. But as long as you just think about yourself, you will never be able to discern God's leading in your life. Would you give me five more? How many give me five more minutes? Five, ten, fifteen, twenty. Okay. All right. I come from New York, and that's how we do it. First Samuel chapter 30. This is the last test. How many have been encouraged to go on? How many right now are facing something in your life that could very tempt you to stop? But you're not going to stop. You're going on. 1 Samuel chapter 30. It came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. Verse 1. And Ziklag was smitten, burned it with fire. They had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away. They went on their way. David and his men came to the city. Now listen to this. And the city, their city, was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters, they were all gone. Verse 4, then David and the people that were with him, listen to this verse, lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. Think about the depth of that pain. And David's two wives were taken captives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people now spake of stoning him because the soul of the people were grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abathah, the priest, Ahimelech's son, bring me the ephod. And Abathah brought hither the ephod to David. And David inquired of the Lord, and I want you to look, this is what he prayed, shall I pursue? 
I want you to make a note of that. Shall I overtake them? And he, the Lord answered, pursue. For thou shalt overtake them. And read the last part with me. And without fail, recover all. It had been a long journey since the day Samuel came to the house. Fifteen years between the oil and the throne. Living in caves. Running from Saul. Being hunted by the army of Israel. A man with a promise. A man upon whose life the hand of God stood. You'd never look at it. You'd never, you'd never notice it. It seemed like everything went wrong in David's life. And yet he's the anointed of the Lord. A man now, he doesn't know this. He is only three days away from the throne. And he's facing the most severe battle of his life. I believe that oftentimes, right before the greatest breakthrough, we face the greatest battle. Don't ever judge where you are by what you're facing. David looked at this and David said, my God, after fighting a war that the Lord told him to fight against the Philistines, he comes back and another enemy, the Amalekites, took advantage while David and the men were gone. Comes back instead of being refreshed, instead of kissing the beautiful faces of those little children. You've seen the pictures when they come back from war and the children and the wives throw themselves into the arms of their husbands. The little kids jump up and the husbands, even the dog goes crazy. This is what David and the men were envisioning. These are weary warriors. God had given them a victory. Instead, they come back to the smell of ashes. They can't even find where their houses are because their charred remains. Everything is burnt. The dogs are gone. The sheep are gone. Nothing is there. The enemy stole it all. Wives, children, everything. And you could just see these men with the weariness of war looking at the greatest loss they could have ever imagined. They begin to weep until they have no more power to weep. That's deep. Their eyes can't produce any more tears. They're teared out. But yet the sorrow still needs to be vented. They're heaving. That's all you would hear if you were passing by the town. You would hear the men. You would hear the weepings of an army. And then the men, being so bitter, start picking up stones. A man they would have given their life for, David, the beloved leader. It's all because of you. If I would have never followed you into this vision, I would have never had this kind of warfare. They pick up the stones, and now here's David. He doesn't have a friend in the world. There's nobody he could begin to lean his head upon their shoulder. But David learned something on his journey when he lived in caves, a lesson that would be so precious to him. You could take my wife, you could take my kids, you could take my city, but you can't take prayer. Amen. 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 He said, bring me the ephod. Because I learned through my journey that the Lord shall preserve me. Amen. And the Bible said, and David encouraged himself. I know what he did to encourage himself. You say, well, how do you know you weren't there? Because I know by my journey. David began to recount every other time he thought he was going to die. But now that is part of his story. David recounted the time, and we can go back and back. How do you encourage yourself? You look at every other time when God showed himself faithful. You start counting the testimonies. You start rehearsing and remembering. There was a day when you thought this is the end and now it's yesterday and you're days ahead of it now. Come on. 
he had encouraged himself. Uh, listen to the heart of David. Now think about this. David's prayer gets me, and I believe it touched the heartstring of God. He would have said, oh, Lord, save me from these men that want to stone me. Now, that's what most people would pray. You could still smell the smoke. Lord, should I pursue? And David went on. He still had it. Lord, should I go forward? Should I pursue the enemy? Those are not the kind of prayers normal people pray. Usually they pray prayers like, oh God, just help me. God, just keep me. That's how 99.9% .9 of people pray. But if you want to grow great, I said if you want to grow great, David with tears will say, do you still got a plan? And the Lord heard that prayer. And you know what God said? Pursue. And you will overtake David. If you just sit in the ashes, you lost. But if you go on and you take another step forward, come on, and you keep on going, David. I'm going to work a miracle, David. And you will, without fail, you will recover everything. Come on. Come on. Come on. You may be facing an obstacle. You don't know how you're going to get through, but take a step forward. Begin to pray prayers. Say, Lord, where do I go from here? Take just one step. Come on. All they did was take one step and the Jordan began to open up. It's amazing what one step forward could do. They took one step and the Red Sea, a wind came and blew the Red Sea and they walked over on dry ground. Come on, take a step forward. Whatever you're facing, maybe God sent me. I'm prophesying. This message is prophecy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What would cause a man to walk on water? He took a step out of the boat. You can get theological and say, you know, I don't know. Does God still cause people to walk on water? I never saw that miracle. That's not in the scripture. And while they're arguing how men can't walk on water, somebody took a step. God doesn't need your brains. He needs your obedience. If you can figure out what God's going to do, I guarantee you, you're not doing what God wants you to do. You think God with all of his eternal wisdom, a God who is infinite, a God who doesn't even know how to spell the word limitation. A God that declares the end from the beginning. A God that already has it worked out before he starts it. A God that can separate light from darkness. And this God's got a plan. You think that God could fit it in your brain? You think the counsel of God, whose ways are past finding out, could fit it into your eight pounds of gray matter and your brain could figure out what God's going to do? You think we can understand how a Pastor Ali, one day as an eight-year-old, was going to school and saying, down with America, down with the West, you, you think you, and that's an apostle? Yeah, can you figure out how we went from there to here? I'll tell you one word, a miracle! Wow! You know what the problem you know what the problem with Western Christianity is? We try to fit God into our theology. 
And just when you think you got them boxed in with all your Greek, Hebrew, that's when God steps out of the box and he said, I'm going to do it another way. Woo! Just when you think there's no way God can do this with that one, God says, watch. You think you can figure out how God can take a man, Saul of Tarsus, that has a murdering spirit? Come on. That will kill Christians, that will destroy churches, and God says you'll be the greatest apostle that ever lived, that will build churches, and that will preach my gospel? You think, you think Paul understood how that happened? Let's interview him. Shall we interview him? Get up, Paul. Get up. Paul, we're here at Gospel Tabernacle, greatest church here, and I'm telling you right now in Vancouver, and we want to ask you a question. We read your story, and we know you used to kill Christians. You were there when they killed Stephen, the first martyr. You used to destroy churches. You used to set them on fire thinking you were doing God a service, but we also know you're one of the greatest apostles that ever lived planting churches wherever you've gone. Paul, tell us, how did that happen? You know what Paul would say? I am what I am by the grace of God. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. 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 Come here, brother. Come here. If you are a man greatly loved by the Spirit of God and you've paid a great price, people would look at you and they see joy. They see zeal, they see enthusiasm. Oh, they didn't know the day when death, the spirit of death was upon you. The day when darkness was your companion. The day when you were lost and you were without direction. But son, my hand is upon your life in a great way. And I've put within you a desire even to go beyond where you presently are. For I have put within your mouth a fiery word, and I've put within your mouth a word that will cause the hearts of men and women to be strengthened and encourage I've called you to be an exhorter. I've called you to be an encourager. For saith the Lord, the path that you're on is not an easy path. For you are one of my horses, and I have put the harness on your life. There are those that will reject the harness. They would rather frolic in the field and yea, but you are going to be a horse that I'm going to use, so I must break you. I must break thee of even down to the depth, saith the Lord, but that's okay because I'm going to use you. I only use broken horses. For they are the ones that will pull the king's carriage. They are the ones that will do my work, saith the Lord. For son, if you will continue to yield and submit to my work, saith God, I will raise thee up and I shall bring forth out of thy life Yea, even a stream of life that will strengthen the people of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, bless our brother. Bless our brother. Bless our brother. The presence of the Lord is so strong. O oh, woman of God. Truly a woman of wisdom you are. You have a keen discernment. And the Lord says that He will give you an eye that will spot the wolf. Even when they come in sheep's clothing. Man of God, you are to regard the discernment that God's given you by this gift. For God has given her a heart for the things of God, but He's given her a heart to protect the things of God. You paid an awesome price. I sense even in concerning this marriage, a price was paid. But truly, I have authorized this union for my glory, for my purposes. And the Lord pours in grace even into this union. Together I have called you to raise up a victorious house. Yes. The sound of victory will always be the predominant sound in this place. Hallelujah. And you will teach the people the way of victory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
The hand of God is on you, O handmaiden of the Lord, and strengthens your heart, your spirit, and your body. Thank you, Lord. Come on, let's just worship, worship, worship. Worship, worship, worship Him. Worship Him, worship Him. Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship the Lord. Let's worship Him. Don't you sense the presence of God? Let's all stand right now. Hallelujah. I want you to lift your hands. And I want to pray for you. In fact, would you just take hands with the person next to you? You're a beautiful body of Christ here. A beautiful body of Christ. Take your hands. And I want you together to lift those hands. And this is going to be a sign that the only way we can really have victory is if we help to lift each other up. Father, in the name of Jesus, I lay my hands upon my brethren. I thank you for Gospel Tabernacle. I thank you, Lord, that in this place there is the sound of freedom and liberty.